So I'd now like to um, open this panel for discussion and questions from the floor. Um, there are microphones um, in each of the aisles. Uh, those of you who have questions or comments, please uh, share them. And please introduce yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Melissa Clark. I'm the Director for Population Health at the National Human Genome Center. And uh, good morning, Bill, and good morning hey, to the STEAM panel. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, this question. We talked a lot and very eloquently uh, spoke about the social determinants of health. And even when you look at epigenetic factors, maternal nutrition, paternal nutrition, um, and other factors, really it's clear that things like green space and supermarket access and neighborhoods all impact uh, the risk for obesity. Um, but then when we hear, look at statistics that are presented, um, such as in the previous talk, which was excellent, but it all, a lot of times they're all around race. And I just wanted to submit, if we're looking at social determinants of health, shouldn't we be looking really at issues around poverty and presenting our statistics around uh, socioeconomic status and zip codes and access to groceries, rather than focusing a lot around around racial um, categorizations of relationships to obesity, which can be instructive, but obviously the story is, is that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I just want to ask that question. So to rephrase it, what's at the heart of these disparities? It, it's not simply a matter of ethnicity. Uh, well, I think I, it's- I, I was under the impression that we hadn't talked about race very much at all, because social determinants of health are really broad. They include where one was born, education. For example, uh, we found that a white man who graduates from college in the United States, when compared with a white man who graduates from college in England, has a five years lower life expectancy. So what is the difference between the United States and England when it comes to that? Well, it's hard to say, but clearly the focus on health promotion, the way they invest their health dollars, uh, we spend a lot of money for health care in this country, but we don't invest a lot of it in health promotion and disease prevention. The Affordable Care Act, and Vivek was involved in this, uh, certainly set aside something called a prevention fund. The idea was that we were going to really invest in improving the social determinants of health. Uh, and of course, that money has not come forth. Uh, the CDC's budget has been... Uh, been really hurt over, over that period of time, but we haven't invested in improving the social determinants of health, like safe places to play and things like that. Other comments? <laughs> Howell. Howell Wexler, Alliance for a Healthy Generation. For the whole panel, what are the two or three most important public policy changes that you think could have the greatest impact on the epidemic that could be implemented right now? Well, I'll just give you one, which has to do with how we fund uh, prevention and health promotion. Right now, the way we fund much of our public health work is divided into sectors. It's a segregated funding. Uh, and this is happening at a time where we are increasingly recognizing that we need sectors to be working together, that we need transportation and housing uh, to be working together with public health and with, uh, with health care uh, to build communities that are healthier. Uh, unless we change that the funding source, unless we either braid funding or create more flexible funding, we're going to constantly have battles over who pays uh, for the initial upfront investment, who's paying to study these interventions. Uh, and right now we have a patchwork uh, where we, of, of public and private funding. What has been exciting and interesting has been to see some of a shift away from the traditional mode of funding toward uh, this new model. We've seen, for example, the Accountable Health Communities at CMS, uh, you know, they spoke about recently and issued as a demonstration project, which is trying to move toward this model of funding community-wide prevention. At an institutional level, we've seen ACOs try to move away from fee-for-service models towards paying, uh, certainly, for, for outcomes. But we're going to need to change overall our funding in communities and tie funding to collaboration if we really want uh, a multi-sector approach that addresses the social determinants of health. <laughs> Top two or three. You're looking at me, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think 
policy changes that can, will promote physical activities in communities and with funding that, that allocates for that. So whether it's producing, make, making safe places to walk, sidewalks. I was just thinking of our own community where many neighborhoods don't have sidewalks that people can go out in. Um, creating financial incentives for builders to do that. So as communities get built or renovated, uh, there is an incentive for the, the engineers and the planners to, to put that into place. Um, a range of governmental incentives to do things that promote the activity rather than uh, de-emphasize, and that certainly includes uh, getting more physical activity back in the schools and, and after school times where um, structures can be used for, for kids to be active and to uh, have a safe place to play. So I think that package of things that create a more active community broadly but at the same time, I think there's been a lot of um, uh, demonstrations that show that when that gets done, housing values go up. It benefits the builders. It benefits the community as a whole. benefits the tax base. Uh, so doing the right thing sometimes also can play into economic growth and, and enhancement of other areas of life. I think the word incentive is really a critical word here. And uh, several major businesses have demonstrated that by providing incentives to their employees, they could increase the number who quit smoking dramatically, increase weight loss, physical activity. Um, so I think we need to provide incentives. And again, the Affordable Care Act attempts that in many areas. Uh, we need to uh, provide rewards. Um, my three top social determinants of health are education, income, and safety. I certainly think we ought to invest in those three areas. Bill? Thanks. Bill Cole, University of Texas. One of the things that came up, uh, Jeff, when you were talking is a uh, bad guy, uh, particularly what we understand from the tobacco, our tobacco experience. Uh, some people talk about food and beverage companies similarly. Um, I'm interested in the thoughts of the, of the panel on something I call the sedentary behavioral industrial complex. <laughs> there are people selling products that create sedentary behavior that are killing us. We haven't defined these things exactly. Every one of you is sitting in a chair right now. We have cars, video games, software. Bill Gates may be as responsible as Ronald McDonald for the obesity epidemic. <laughs> How do we define this for people? How do we have the, the equivalent for physical, Bill, Bill uh, Deese, I think appropriately said, one of the most underappreciated uh, uh, aspects of the uh, obesity epidemic is, um, or prevention is physical activity. How do we define this such that it, the, the, the sedentary behavior industry uh, gets uh, defined and, and recognized, much like the tobacco industry or the food and beverage industry? <laughs> well, <laughs> let, me, let me say two things about your question, which I think is a very interesting one. Um, I wonder how Bill Gates would feel about your question. It's very interesting. But one thing I, I would say is I, I want to be cautious about villainizing too quickly. And, uh, and I know that's not what you were trying to do, but the reason I mentioned this is because sometimes uh, when people are building public health campaigns and other campaigns, there's a tendency to just pick a, a bad guy and just try to nail him to the wall uh, and say this person is responsible for everything, et cetera. But as Dr. Copeland mentioned, this is what we're dealing with with obesity is a little bit different from tobacco, where there are some nuances here. So for example, the food and beverage industry, I would not cast uh, as the bad guy overall. You know, there, Could some of their practices be better? Absolutely. Uh, they have stepped up, certainly in partnership with the First Lady and Partnership for Healthy America and others to be partners. Uh, in creating better health, but undoubtedly there's more that they need to do, uh, you know, to, to ensure that people are eating and drinking uh, healthier products. But what I do want to say is that, you know, if we, when we think about this, we have to approach, I think, from a bit of a collaboration model when it comes to looking at these other actors, even if we recognize that some of their practices are contributing to the problem. The second thing I, I want to say, though, is that part of how we're going to shift the products and services that are offered is by shifting demand as well. So if we look at food, for example, 
we know that there is a greater demand now uh, for certain types of healthier products uh, than there was 20 years ago because people are now have a, a growing awareness that uh, perhaps you know eating of foods that are highly processed so that are higher in sugar higher in salt uh, may not be good for you uh, do we need to increase that demand a whole lot more yes do we have to bring down the price of healthy options absolutely yes because they're far out of reach uh, for far too many people so part of me thinks well, how can we increase the demand for tools uh, that will allow for better nutrition and for physical activity. But well, one interesting example that's been in the news uh, recently, uh, and I don't hold this up as a model for exactly what we should do, but it's an interesting example to consider, uh, is actually Pokemon Go. So some of you are familiar with Pokemon Go. Uh, you may have read about it in the news. Uh, my sister-in-law uh, came to visit. Um, as, uh, as Bill mentioned, I, uh, my wife and I had a child about three and a half weeks ago. Uh, we were learning a whole lot about being parents. Um, <laughs> nothing makes you feel as dumb as becoming a new parent. <laughs> Wait till they're teenagers. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> but you know, in my so my sister-in-law came to visit to help us uh, take care of the baby, and uh, she was telling us that she's been, uh, you know, playing the Pokemon Go, uh, you know, application on the on the Pokemon Go application, and you know, she would disappear for a couple of hours at a time and come back with like twelve thousand steps, fifteen thousand steps. Well, where did you go? She's like, oh, you know, I was playing on Pokemon Go. Uh, so what's interesting is, and I want to be cautious about that because we know that there have been some stories about people getting into accidents because they're not watching where they're going, you know, and just walking through the streets, et cetera. So we have to do these things safely. But that's actually a, a creative way that we can use technology that on the one hand could be sedentary inducing, right? If it just pushes you to sit in front of a screen at home and play a game. But on the other hand, it can be used uh, to promote physical activity. Even the development of tools that track steps I think have been a helpful step forward in getting people more active. When I was practicing at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, the hospital decided that they would start a Fitbit competition uh, between the, uh, the clinicians, put us in teams of eight, pitted us against each other, um, recognizing that many people were very competitive at the hospital. <laughs> and you had people who were you know, who said, you know, gosh, I don't have time to like do, uh, fill out another set of pap papers. I don't have time to like do yet more billing, you know, like for, uh, you know, for patients. I don't have time to go to yet another like, you know, quality improvement meeting. But somehow they were finding time to get 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 steps a day. And we said, what on earth are you doing? Uh, but because the incentives were aligned for them there, what they started doing is actually incorporating walking into their everyday life. Right, and, and sh switching things. So instead of, for example, getting together with people over coffee, they would get together and go for a walk, which is what I started to do with friends. And so part of this is about creating demand, which I think we can do by creating the right incentives. Uh, from And this is partly a, an innovation challenge. It's partly also a cultural challenge. I would love to see the day when the phrase, let's meet up for coffee, is replaced by the phrase, let's meet up for a walk. Because I say, let's meet up for coffee, and I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> but I say that because it's just part of our vernacular. We sit down with somebody and converse. But the idea of actually taking a walk with somebody and conversing, it's a subtle but powerful shift. That's part of the cultural change that I think can drive behavior change. Mm -hmm. That's already started in some institutions. That when I was CDC director, what I wanted to do when I wasn't able to achieve it, so this is a failure, was in the conference room where we all met for interminable meetings, replace all the chairs with exercycles and have a light attached to it so you had to generate enough energy to power the light if you wish to speak or make a comment. <laughs> and the chair would have the ability to up the um, degree of difficulty of your pedaling uh, thing. We never accomplished that, but it would be a good thing. Well, it, it sounds like it would have been very self-serving for you as well. You were the only person who could do that. <laughs> the um, Robert Wichasson Foundation converted two of its first floor conference rooms into conference rooms that you reserved. One has four treadmills facing each other, mm. places for computers, uh, laptops to, or um, pads to fit on them, um, well wired so you can have conference calls with other sites. And those are in constant use during the day with people signing up. And they're capped at a certain level of speed so that you're not there for, to run 20 miles. It's a slow walk and then in the <laughs> better weather, they have paths all around the building, and you regularly see groups of four or five, middle of the day walking, just as, as you indicated. 
so that these things uh, can be done and make a certain emphasis. It, they're bits and pieces of things, and they can probably only be done in places that afford it. But a walk in a group it can take place most anywhere and works. Mm -hmm. the, to, to Bill's point about the sedentary industrial complex, this isn't new. Many of the things in our daily lives that we would all see as vital and necessary and worthwhile, washing machines, dryers, uh, all the mechanical stuff that helps us in our daily lives are actually the things that have taken away bits and pieces of physical activity from our lives for the past hundred uh, years. So um, it's not just the remote control that has uh, led to this. So it's uh, th that the point is well taken. At the same time as we're succumbing to things that give us less opportunity for physical activity, we've got to look for things like Pokemon Go, or, or the, the Wii, is it, that, that you can do dancing and movements to while in front of a screen. It's not ideal from a wouldn't it be good to go outside and play ball perspective, but where you can't do that, it does allow physical activity to take place. Dr. Satcher, then you. you know, as I was listening, I, I think one of the things we can do better is to put more attention on positive models where people have done things that we can show that they're making a difference. In 2001, I think when I released a report on women and smoking, California was the only state in the union, I believe, and that had in 1987 outlawed smoking in public places. And um, what we were able to show was that it was also the only state where lung cancer death were not increasing among women. But today, I guess there are, what, 27, 28 states that have laws and many cities outlawing smoking in public places. But we don't, we don't pay a lot of attention to the Robert Johnson Foundation, the outstanding leadership in the area that Jeff pointed out. I just think we need to do a better job of really highlighting successful models if we're going to make real progress. So I think we have time for two more questions. Eduardo and then Shriki. Good morning. Um, I'm Eduardo Santos. I work for the American Heart Association. I serve on the round table. Um, really great discussion and great questions and great answers. Um, I live in a community where a stealth issue has emerged uh, that I think is a, an issue that I'd love to hear, hear some comment about, and that's the, the issue of um, loose dogs. Um, and, and loose dogs in Dallas, Texas, where I live, are a proxy for um, lack of safety, or a proxy for social determinants of health. The focus in Dallas has been on the injury side of things, which is very, very appropriate. But it would seem to me that from the perspective of ability to be physically active, step out of your door, um, never mind whether there's sidewalks or not, there's loose dogs. Um, Dallas is a north-south kind of city. North is affluent, south is not. Um, south, there's an estimated 9,000 loose dogs. North, there were so few dogs, uh, in fact, no dogs seen on, in the sampling methodology that there is no estimate for how few loose dogs there are in North Dallas. 85% um, of dogs are spayed and neutered in North Dallas. Um, it's the complete opposite in, in South Dallas. Um, and even as it relates to social cohesion, I would think uh, that the uh, fear of walking around in your neighborhood might um, lead to a decrease in social cohesion. Last sort of anecdote, um, people in South Dallas buy golf clubs, not to play golf, uh, but to um, protect themselves from dogs when they're out and about. Um, and I just wonder if there aren't some other stealth issues that um, are part of the logic model of why perhaps in some places people aren't as active as they might be, feel as safe as they might be, or as connected as they might be. Mm -hmm. There are some communities where it's not safe to walk out on your porch in the morning. And believe me, in those communities, people are not going to be going for walks. 
So I, I just think that as a society, we ought to prioritize investing in making communities safer. And again, I think that was part of what the Affordable Care Act had in mind with some components of the prevention agenda, which have not been funded. But I do think it's worth our while to invest in safe communities. So I agree with Ed Water that we need to invest in that. Shriki? Thank you. And I would just say I agree too if someone has been chased by many dogs. <laughs> <laughs> can you, in your uniform? No, not in my <laughs> <laughs> These are well-educated dogs. A, a, permanent a, a permanent anecdote that I carry to this day from Eduardo involves an armadillo in his attic. <laughs> and his um, clever um, ability to get it out of there using a balance beam that got it out a window and other, other things. Now I will think of him in terms of loose dogs. <laughs> and, uh, um. Shariki Kumanika, I'm um, at Drexel University School of Public Health, working on weight issues primarily in African Americans. Um, I want to return to the issue of marketing things that are unhealthy for profit, which is a part of the issue. Uh, it's especially clear in food marketing area. And I want to ask maybe if there are lessons from uh, other successes of how you prevent interventions that work well in the more advantaged communities from shifting the problem into the less advantaged communities so that the things that, that you can't any longer sell in suburbia, um, the marketers may go to their base in a low-income community where that's still popular and it's very affordable. And I really worry about that from a, a balanced perspective of whether we have things in place that prevent some of our interventions from actually doing harm and widening gaps. And there's been some study of this um, in Europe and looking globally to see what happens to low socioeconomic status communities, for example, with certain interventions. Um, if you don't organize them right, it's possible that they could do harm when you mean to do good. And I wonder if there are any lessons to tobacco, you know, this tobacco target marketing, for example, in black communities. And was that a consideration in the success story for um, tobacco? I'll just briefly say, I think the cocaine epidemic of the 80s is another very good example. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Cocaine became affordable, it went to the black community, uh, violence followed, mass incarceration, and so it's a good example of something where there were people uh, using cocaine in their homes, in the comfort of their homes in other communities, but it came and became affordable as crack cocaine in black communities. I, I, and we've talked about this a little bit in terms of the opioid addiction problem. Uh, I wish that somehow in the 80s, there was more of an informed approach in terms of dealing with addiction. So I'm really pleased that you're doing this report on opioid addiction. But I'm, I, that comes to my mind. But Chiriki, for, to, for tobacco and, and also some alcohol products, uh, that marketing will go on for many products to wherever there's a susceptible group that can incre increase sales. And it certainly was successful for mentholated cigarettes in mm -hmm. some communities and some specific alcohol products. There's also an international element to this, which is where sales begin to drop for goods in the US market. One looks for other markets to transport them to as if the world community uh, didn't exist as a community. Uh, you can move things there. It also happens with uh, toxic chemicals and, and their um, storage and, and removal from one area to another. So there's a, there is a pattern in multiple areas of public health in which items that are toxic either by ingestion or by exposure or um, by, by uh, addiction uh, get shifted onto vulnerable communities and other sites. Um, well, thank you. We're about to take a 15-minute break, but before we do, the, so um, thanks again to the panel. This was a, a great morning. Thanks. Thank you.